Okay, um, so this talk's inspired by a case that was encountered pre-hospital with a, an eight-year-old boy that was hit in the neck at a rug, with a rug, uh, during rugby and uh, developed inspiratory stridor. And when the retrieval, retrieval team got there, they had to decide whether or not they should transfer him um, with because he was maintaining his own airway at the time or intubate him with um, evidence of laryngeal injury. And they elected to intubate him pre-hospital and he was, he was taken to the kids where um, he was found to have a laryngeal fracture. So I thought I'd do some research on different ways to manage uh, blunt laryngeal injury because it's quite controversial at the moment. Um, okay, so causes of trauma, laryngeal trauma, can be classified into two categories. External causes, which are then further subdivided into blunt and penetrating and then internal factors like iatrogenic injury from bronchoscopy or um, intubation. So this talk will focus primarily on external causes, specifically uh, blunt trauma. Um, there are multiple mechanisms of blunt airway injury. Um, uh, firstly, you've got rapid blunt floor supplied to the anterior neck, which can crush the larynx against the cervical spine and cause avulsion of the larynx from the distal, distal trachea. Um, so this can occur during sport, um, which was seen with this young boy. Um, and uh, like in rugby or karate or whatever. And then you have rapid deceleration um, and or forceful compression of injuries of the chest with the closed glottis. This can cause an avulsion of the larynx from the trachea via shearing forces or can cause laryngeal fractures or mucosal disruption. And then lastly, blunt trauma to the chest can cause tracheal laceration. Injuries involving a great deal of force may damage the intrinsic laryngeal muscles, the vocal folds, or the dual nerve supply to the larynx from the superior and recurrent laryngeal nerves. Pathology is varied, um, and this can result in obstructive edema, submucosal hematomas or tears, complete laryngotracheal separation, false and true vocal cord avulsions, thyroid cartilage fractures, and cricoid cartilage ring or thyroid fractures. This is just a picture of the of endoscopy which showed a right arytenoid swelling in the in the young boy that was taken to the kids hospital with the laryngeal injury. And then we have a picture of a normal larynx and then a, a fractured larynx on the right. So mortality has been reported as high as 40% for blunt laryngeal injuries and is commonly due to asphyxia. Airway obstruction has also been attributed to mortality resulting from aspiration of blood, airway disruption and expanding hematomas. Hematomas are particularly important when associated with cricoid injuries because the complete cricoid ring does not allow for an expanding hematoma, um, thus resulting in rapid obstruction of the airway. So quick and accurate assessment of the airway and consequent stabilisation of the airway is vital. The delay in diagnosis that can occur with a blunt injury um, due to its insidious presentation contributes to the high mortality um, associated with blunt laryngeal injuries as opposed to penetrating injuries. Even relatively minor injuries can lead to permanent phonic, swallowing or respiratory difficulties. So assessment is the cornerstone of management. Um, laryngeal trauma is heterogeneous in its presentation so that can make manage management challenging. A thorough assessment includes ascertaining the mechanism of injury, the level of the injury and the severity of the injury. Knowledge of, from this assessment can give clues to the underlying pathology. The clinical presentation is usually consistent with the mechanism of injury. The injury itself can be insidious in presentation and often not show signs um, from 24 hours to 48 hours after the injury. This leads to potential adverse outcomes. So a high index of suspicion must be present when there is a history of blunt force applied to the neck. Common symptoms and signs of laryngeal trauma relate to airway compromise and they include dysphonia ranging from hoarseness to aphonia, stridor, subcutaneous emphysema, dyspnea, hemoptysis, dysph dysphagia, anterior neck tenderness, and loss of normal laryngeal architecture. So aphonia can be an indication of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, fracture of the thyroid cartilage, vocal cord hematoma, or subluxation of the arytenoids. Subcutaneous emphysema can be an indication of the disruption of some portions of the aerodigestive system. Pneumothorax and can be a non-specific sign of laryngeal fracture. And then dysphagia can be an indication of esophageal injury or injuries to the surrounding tissue. Just a picture of a lady that does have blunt laryngeal injury and um, this was her only presenting sign. So looking at management, um, any patient with blunt laryngeal tracheal trauma should be viewed as having an unstable airway. First and foremost, the primary goal is to stabilise the airway 
Um, and so there's a large amount of debate as to how this should occur. The contention uh, centres largely around endotracheal intubation versus emergency tracheostomy. So some authors argue that orotracheal intubation shouldn't be performed unless evaluating the airway endoscopically first. So obviously in the pre-hospital setting this is not um, available and this may not be appropriate either if there's impending um, airway compromise. But the proposed reasons against orotracheal intubation include the potential for associated C-spine injuries, soft tissue edema, laryngeal laceration and hemorrhage, displaced anatomy and laryngotracheal separation. So attempts at intubation can further worsen the injury and lead to loss of the airway altogether. So all of these factors make failing intubation more likely and can lead to performing an emergency tracheostomy in less than ideal circumstances. Cricothyroidotomy is contraindicated as it can worsen the laryngeal injury and is not a definitive airway. There is the counter argument that intubation may be safer than tracheostomy, especially in an era where emergency tracheostomies are no longer frequently performed. The caveat to this argument is that intubation should be performed by an experienced personnel with the airway clearly visualised. The orotracheal tube should be one size smaller than estimated to account for edema and minimise further damage to the airway. And the, and the tube should be advanced and secured distal to the lesion. So looking at the evidence, um, in a small analysis conducted by Bojani, um, they found that of the 15 patients requiring emergency airways following blunt trauma, 14 received an endotracheal tube with no complications. And this is supported by Kumar, who also found the tracheal tube placed below the level of the injury is a safe and legitimate form of airway stabilisation. So they also found that in the pre-hospital setting, orotracheal intubation was the most common form of management with minimal complications. So once the airway is stabilised, um, the management can then take two forms. Uh, Non-operative management, which involves a stable airway or when the airway has an endotracheal tube in situ. Uh, this sort of form of management should be considered in the following injuries, minor laryngeal lacerations without exposed cartilage or bone and minor hematomas. The patient should be sent to ICU. Serial flexible bronchoscopic examination should be undertaken. A histamine blocker could be considered. The evidence for steroids is controversial and um, the evidence for ant antibiotics is still uh, controversial and equivocal at the moment. So this is a picture of cricoid cartilage fracture and cricotracheal separation being managed operatively. <laughs> um, <coughs> so then you've got operative management, the indications for operative management, airway obstruction requiring tracheostomy, uncontrolled subcutaneous emphysema, extensive mucosal lacerations with exposed cartilage, vocal cord paralysis, and grossly deformed fractures of the larynx, thyroid cartilage or cricoid cartilage. So I guess what remains paramount is that the airway should be secured in the most timely manner possible and should be done by an experienced anaesthetist by a technique that they feel most comfortable with. Um, so it's well known that level of experience and training of the clinician will influence the patient outcome and even if that particular technique is um, advocated, if the, experience, the clinician is inexperienced in this technique, it can provide an even more adverse outcome than performing a procedure <coughs> they're well trained in, however suboptimal it may be. Now, um, it's a relatively rare event, I think. So I was just wondering whether some of our more uh, experienced colleagues, shall we say, people like Dr. Gibson, <laughs> might, have, uh, might have had some experience that can, you know, can add to, to you know, if you've come across this a lot. A couple, a couple. We, when I was uh, seeing that last time, I knew we had a big island Thumb over the hole to talk. <laughs> 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 so he's breathing through the hole, and then he put his thumb over his hole, and he goes, 
They didn't describe their technique at all. They just, I think they did a retrospective analysis and just looked at the intervention, and the intervention was just described as intubation, not the anaesthetic technique. And the little boy who got intubated in the field. Yeah. Ketamine, ketamine and sucks. Yeah. I think it's pretty important, isn't it, the, the issue of how you go about doing it. Yeah. And certainly, Kathy's description of gassing them down. Yeah. With or without ether sounds like, <laughs> sounds like a, a, the best way to go from. I would imagine. But well, I mean, the principle of someone with stride or is that you don't stop and breathe. Mm -hmm. that, that, that you get them deep enough to have a look and visualise the larynx. And I think, I, I think in my own mind, if you think that you're visualising a glottis isn't going to be a major problem, then, then you can breathe them down and, and do it that way. But if you think they've got other signs that they may be difficult to intubate, then an awake.
Just to stop the acid reflux and irritating the airway even more. Um, I was going to ask you, Sheila, if, um, oh, if Northern know. Ireland had a propensity they're, they're for laryngeal trauma. Yeah, we, we were lucky this guy had been, he came in the hole, and I just, as an intern, I put the tube straight to the hole because he had been shot with a bullet that had ricocheted off the wall so that. Thanks for coming, Charlie. That's the, the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you get some breakfast, Charlie? <laughs> and I'll, I'll make sure you get down on the CPD list. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other comments? I just don't know what the right thing to do in the field with this little boy was. You know, if he if he had the sitting. Well, that's the thing. I mean, intubating them back of a helicopter if you've suddenly, because yeah, you don't know if they're suddenly going to collapse. Where the transport is and the length of time and all those sort of things to make that decision. Exactly, yeah. I guess you want to do it before it gets any worse as well. Yeah. Actually, Charlie, you can redeem yourself. You've just done care flight, haven't you? Mm -hmm. So what's the teaching for blunt laryngeal trauma in the field? That'll teach you. Not as be caused by food for our body.
Yeah, he received this. This child received nebulized adrenaline before, but it didn't do. It didn't help. But yeah, it seems to have a place in the algorithm. Yeah, in a big centre like this, I think so. I think it seems like a reasonable form of management. But I guess if the the airway is compromised already when you get down there. Someone to hold someone, they yeah. struggle, don't they? And then that yeah. their, their airways. Well, they're going to be trying to yeah. mm. Mm. <laughs> 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 All right. Any further comments? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>